Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's webinar titled Using Oligos Printed on Demand with Enzymatic DNA Synthesis Accelerates Candida Glabrolta Mutagenesis Workflow. My name is Ellen Sims and I'll be moderating today's session and I'm delighted to introduce today's webinar speakers. We're joined by Dr. Colin Claret, who's a postdoc at the Pasteur Institute, and also Stephen Quistad, who is an application scientist at DNA Script. In this session, get an introduction into enzymatic DNA synthesis and the syntax system. Hear a case study of how this can accelerate innovation and discover the advantages of making on-demand DNA with enzymes. Following on from the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. So if you do have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to submit these at any time during the webinar. You can submit your question to the left of your screen, just click on the purple tab. So without further delay, I'd like to hand over to our speakers for today's presentation, and I'd like to thank them for presenting to us today. Please go ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today on this webinar. Uh, so my name is Stephen Quistad. I'm an application scientist at DNA Script, and I'm really excited to be here today with all of you guys to tell you a bit about our uh, syntax system uh, and what we've been up to over at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. So just a brief overview of where, where I'll be taking you guys today. So I'm going to start off with a brief introduction to syntax technology, uh, how everything works. Then I'm going to dive into how syntax has actually been used in a real-life test case over at the Institute Pasteur. And then I'm going to pass off to Dr. Colin Claret, uh, who is a postdoc over at Pasteur, and he's been uh, using the syntax uh, throughout his experimentation. So to start off, a little overview of syntax and our technology. Uh, so before we go into the technology, just a little bit about who we are uh, as DNA Script. Um, so DNA Script was founded back in 2014 by a group of three engineers, our co-founders, uh, and they came from a background with uh, synthetic biology, uh, with most of them working in uh, the oil and gas industry for Total. And they really realized that uh, access to on-demand custom DNA was a major bottleneck in a lot of their experiments that they were doing. And that's kind of the, fine, the founding principle behind DNA Script. Uh, we really would like to change the system from the current global centralized model for DNA synthesis and really decentralize DNA synthesis and bring it back into the laboratory. So that was back in 2014. So fast forward to 2021. So I joined the company about two years ago and we were about 40 or so people. And now um, we're over 120 or so. Uh, we've expanded uh, outside of Paris and now we have a US headquarters opened in Q4 of 2019 uh, in South San Francisco. And this, uh, let me just start the pointer, and this uh, beautiful machine down in the bottom right, uh, so that's our syntax system. Uh, that's our very first unit that we're selling, uh, the world's first uh, DNA printer uh, powered by Enzymatic DNA Synthesis Technology, or EDS, which I'll be telling you a bit about today. And these are the three uh, underlying principles for, for the syntax system uh, that we've kind of built everything upon. So first off, uh, same day results. So what does that actually mean? Um, so at the moment, if you would like some DNA to do whatever type of experiment, uh, you go online, you order your DNA, you wait for your DNA to arrive. Maybe the DNA, you can expedite it. It takes an, uh, a day or two. Maybe if you need some modifications, it can take weeks or even months. Or if you're super unlucky, uh, the DNA could get lost in the mail. Or if we happen to be in a global pandemic, maybe the DNA never comes. So all these are kind of scenarios where you don't actually have control over getting your DNA. You're waiting for it to arrive in the mail. However, with Syntax, you're able to actually print your DNA uh, and have your DNA uh, that same day to do your experiments. So really being able to boost productivity uh, and, and do your runs overnight. And with that comes a lot of flexibility. So it's no longer designing your experiment and waiting uh, for everything to arrive to start. Uh, you think of an experiment uh, in the morning, let's say, you design your oligos, you're printing them by the end of the day and starting your experiments the following day. Uh, so really it's flexible for whatever kind of experimental plan you want to do. Uh, so you work on your own schedule and not the schedule of the oligo providers. 
And finally, this plug and play model. Uh, and what we mean by this is, uh, so to operate the syntax, you really need a sub competent level, uh, some sub minimal competent level of any kind of molecular biology to operate the system. Even if you can barely pipette, uh, it's really easy to set up. So you, you get all the reagents and it takes about 15 to 30 minutes to set up a run. Uh, you put the cartridge into the machine, uh, which is located uh, right here. And here you can see our, our software. And uh, you basically just have a spreadsheet. We have a column with your primary name, uh, with your oligos, and you upload that to our software and create what's called a print job. Now uh, that whole process takes about five minutes and you're off to the races. Um, so depending on how long you print a piece of DNA, that determines how long the run will take. Uh, so at the moment, if you were just doing, let's say, 20 mers for PCR primers, uh, you could theoretically launch a run in the morning, have your uh, desalted, normalized oligos ready for experimentation uh, at the end of the day, set up your PCRs overnight, uh, and be, uh, have your results the next morning. So really accelerating uh, the, uh, the ability to do your experimentation. So the syntax, the system, uh, so this is part of uh, an entire platform in uh, three main parts. So here we have our box, our uh, DNA printer powered by the EDS technology that I mentioned. And it, using, uh, so it's really a plug and play model. So we have automated synthesis for whatever you would like. Uh, purification, quantification, and all normalization is all performed in the machine. So you get a 96 well plate of normalized oligos when your run is done, ready to go for your experiments. Then our next aspect we have is our uh, um, control software. Uh, so though that's what you see displayed on the screen right here. Uh, so this does a couple things. One thing that's really cool uh, is it's actually able to predict how difficult your piece of DNA will be to synthesize. So uh, if you've ever um, designed primers before, um, maybe you've, you've noticed that it's not good to have a lot of Gs into a primer, let's say. Uh, so a lot of Gs can form what are called G quadruplex structures. And that makes it very difficult to create a very pure piece of DNA. Um, and this is a problem that uh, you have to, if you're making DNA using enzymes, or if you're making uh, DNA using traditional phosphor amide chemistry, lots of Gs are hard to do. So one of the many things that our software does is it actually predicts pieces uh, or regions of your DNA that might be hard. And then you have the ability to go back and if your system allows it, change those nucleotides. So you can actually uh, improve the purity of the DNA you make. And this process of uh, going back, changing, and uploading the whole software, uh, it's super quick, just a matter of minutes for this algorithm to predict your piece of DNA. Uh, so really allows you to play around with your sequences. And finally, we have um, uh, our reagents. So at the moment, our first kits we're selling are 60 cycles, 96 oligos. So what does this actually mean? So our first version is in a 96 well format. So like I mentioned, your oligos come out in a uh, 96 well plate. And 60 cycles, what does, that, what does that actually mean? So there's enough reagents in each kit to, per, to produce one plate of 60 mers on a 96 well plate, or two plates of 30 mers and anything in between. So there's enough reagents to create up to a 60 nucleotide in each well, and then you can do less, uh, less of that depending on what type of experiment you're doing. And everything comes uh, in this reagent kit, including our inks uh, for now, A, T, C, and G. We're working on a bunch of others. Uh, the only things you actually have to provide are normal uh, things you have around the lab, so a bit of ethanol and a bit of isopropanol. Other than that, everything comes uh, ready to go. And this is the kind of ecosystem that we really want to support with syntax. So the idea where you're designing your oligos, you're printing within a matter of hours, testing those oligos, and based on those results, you're able to redesign, print, and test. So really increasing the speed of iteration for your experimentation. So how does it all work? Um, so here are some, some of the details behind how, how our enzymatic DNA synthesis or EDS biochemistry actually functions. So just to take you a bit through the slide, uh, we have three main components down here. So in blue, we have our engineered polymerase. So this is what actually adds an, uh, the nucleotides onto the growing piece of DNA. Um, and the key, so this, uh, the key to this polymerase is it's template independent. So it's able to add a nucleotide onto a piece of DNA without having any template. Um, so <clears throat> what's important in the system if we're gonna control it is we want it to add one nucleotide 
and we want to add the nucleotide we want. So how we add one nucleotide at a time is uh, we have uh, reversibly terminated uh, uh, oligonucleotides. Um, uh, uh, sorry, it's nucleotides, uh, and they have this blocking group uh, designated in the orange here. So when we combine our polymerase with a blocked nucleotide, we're able to add a single base at a time and the single base that we want. Uh, and then one more key part of our system uh, designated by the black here is our liberation site. Um, and so after you synthesize your piece of DNA, uh, we use another enzyme to cleave off that DNA. Uh, your DNA comes off scarless, uh, and then it goes through desalting and normalization uh, within the syntax system. So we move over to the right here, we see the entire process depicted in this circle. Um, and if any of you are familiar with Illumina chemistry, maybe this looks a bit familiar, it's a very similar principle. So if we start at the top, we have uh, this gray circle, which is our solid support. And to that, we have um, a little piece of DNA, which we call our initiator DNA or iDNA. So what this is used for, so it turns out like most enzymes, uh, our polymerase likes to have a bit of, uh, a bit, a bit of something to grab onto before it starts doing its job. And in this case, that's what this iDNA is for. So after the iDNA, uh, what, what we do is we add our polymerase and then our nucleotide of choice. Uh, because it's that blocked group, we add one nucleotide at a time. We then uh, deblock, exposing that A, and then we add whatever nucleotide we want next, uh, and we just repeat this cycle of elongation, deep protection, washing for as long as you want your DNA. Um, well, uh, one thing to point out too, that's uh, very unique to our system, it's really cool with this iDNA. Um, so it's possible to have custom iDNA where we actually have this piece before the cleavage site, which uh, never gets cut off. However, we can also prepare what uh, we call these, this whole thing we call a resin. Um, so we can create what are called custom resins where you can add a constant sequence after the liberation site here, and then you can print whatever you want uh, after that part. So what does this mean? So if you have, for example, any types of experiments where you have any type of constant region, whether you're cloning or if you do uh, P5, P7 sequencing with Illumina for library prep, uh, we can actually create a resin where you would put, for example, the P5, P7 after the liberation site. You could then print your primers. And then when you cleave, you'll have a primer that has a P5, P7 plus whatever primer, uh, normal primer you want. So approaches like these can really decrease in, for example, library preparation time. And so at the moment, we're about 10 minutes per cycle, something that we're trying to improve. Uh, and then uh, once we have cleaved our DNA, uh, we have our, what we call post-synthesis processing, or PSP. And that's where our desalting, UV quantification, and normalization takes place. And so depending on um, how long you're, you're printing, so at the moment, it's about eight hours uh, from pressing go to having your normalized desalted oligos uh, to have a, a plate of 20 mers or uh, about a plate of PCR size oligos. If you're doing 60 mers, it's about 12 hours. So what that means in practice is we would usually set up a run or, uh, around 5 p.m., let's say, and then uh, it prints overnight. And then the next morning, you have your oligos ready to use. So that's a bit about our technology. Now I'm gonna tell you specifically about the pasture syntax uh, and what we've been up to over there. So back in February, 2021, uh, DNA Script in installed a demo lab in, in the Pasture Institute in Paris. Uh, and this is in this image, that's what you're looking at here. Uh, so this is our box syntax. Uh, this is where the software is displayed. Uh, at the moment, it's just a little window. Uh, and then below we have our reagents in these two four degree fridges. Uh, a waste bottle here, and then we have some reagents, uh, our nucleotides and enzymes that are kept at minus 20. Um, so that's all you need to provide, uh, some four degree space, some minus 20 space. And at the moment we have uh, over 32 runs that have been completed. So over 3000 oligos that we've printed. Uh, and these have been distributed across uh, nine different labs uh, and 11 different projects. And we're currently performing about one to two runs per week. And so this graph is just to illustrate the, the use of syntax over time at pasture. So we have the number of oligos printed on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is just time and weeks. So the whole point of this is we see steady increase over time, uh, just, just uh, showing uh, steady use over time and steady demand. So lots of different groups uh, have been really interested in using the system. 
And to show you a bit about what they're printing in terms of size, so here we have the number of oligos across those 32 runs, and then the oligo size in base pairs. So this lower limit, um, so that's about as short as you can print with syntax, uh, and we see this spike around 20 mers. Um, so a lot of that has been for PCR-based applications, uh, particularly mutagenesis. Um, and then this 50 mer uh, spike is for uh, some custom rRNA depletion projects that I'll, I'll mention for a, a little bit in the next slide. And so something to point out too, uh, this upper limit for that's uh, at 60. So we actually had to lock in the specs for our first uh, syntax uh, a long time ago. So we had to be really conservative on what we said we would deliver. So the 60 nucleotide length is in no way a maximum length that we can print using our EDS technology. We can print over 200 base pairs at this point. Um, however, 60 nucleotides is actually what the software will let you print at this moment. So it's just a matter of, of some software upgrades and stuff. Um, so that's why 60 is the upper limit here, uh, because it's our first version. Uh, but we can print much longer than 60 right, right now. So what are they being used for? Um, so these are the various applications over at Pasture. So as I mentioned, a lot of them are PCR-based and, and uh, some custom probe depletion projects. Um, so we have this, so this big chunk of green, uh, so the PCR mutagenic, PC, mutagenic PCRs. So a lot of those have actually been uh, printed by Dr. Colin Claret, which he is uh, going to tell you all about right after I'm done speaking. Um, and then we have uh, these ones in blue and orange. So these are part of a rRNA depletion and COVID genome depletion. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it today, but uh, the principle is basically this. Uh, if you do any kind of transcriptomic work, you want to get rid of all of your 16S RNA. Uh, and 16S takes up uh, anywhere from 80 to 95 percent of the total RNA. Uh, the kits that are on the market right now rely on uh, usually model organisms, uh, and they don't always deplete the rRNA uh, of non-model organism systems. However, there's some kits where you can actually design and create custom probes and incorporate them into the kit for whatever model you're, you're working with. At the moment, to make custom probes and uh, order them, design them, and uh, receive them, it takes about a month. Uh, so we're able to design and print uh, within two days with Syntax. And we also have a group that, that's working on Amplicon panels. Uh, uh, they're creating a custom panel, and uh, through Syntax, they're able to rapidly test, redesign, print, and improve the panel performance for uh, poor performing oligo or poor performing Amplicons. Uh, so another uh, uh, advantage of having the system in-house, uh, you can quickly iterate based on the results you have. And that's all for me today. So uh, I'm happy to pass over to Dr. Colin Claret, who's going to tell you a bit about his uh, Candida mutagenesis project. So thank you all for your attention today. Hi, everyone. I'm Colin Claret. I'm working in the mycology department of Institut Pasteur. And my project focuses uh, on Candida genus. Uh, and my project is more specifically about antifungal resistance and the involvement of protein kinase into uh, antifungal resistance in two different species, Candida glabrata and uh, Candida oris. So today I'm going to talk about the mutant generation with uh, DNA script syntax primers for Candida glabrata kinase genes. So uh, Candida glabrata uh, is part of uh, the Candida genus, which are uh, fungal pathogens that are uh, living are, as common soul into uh, intestinal and uh, genital tract of humans. But in case of immunodepression or immunosuppression of humans, they're able to um, pass into the bloodstream and infect bloodstream leading to a uh, bloodstream infection and also kidney burden leading to death. So the most common uh, agent of candidemia is candida albicans, uh, which is known for, um, for several years now, but uh, candida glabrata is an emerging threat uh, that is uh, more and more found in, in, uh, in candidemia uh, patients uh, across the years. So the pathogenicity of Candida glabrata is quite different from Candida albicans. Candida albicans is able to produce IFEs that are able to uh, pass the bloodstream barrier and to make Candida albicans uh, infect the blood. 
Contact Laborata is not able to produce IFE, therefore the, the passage through uh, bloodstream from, uh, of Contact Laborata is not yet known. Candida Glabrata, because, uh, because of his ability to produce IV, is able to produce uh, sick biofilms that is able to then produce uh, planktonic cells that are able to once again uh, be transported into the bloodstream and infect uh, another organs, another part of the body. Candida Glabrata is not able to produce IV, so he's still able to produce biofilm, but much thinner, uh, constitutively one uh, layer, one monolayer of cells. Candida albicans is able to pierce uh, macrophages because of his IV production. And Candida gravata has another technique to escape a recognition by macrophages. is able to multiply into the macrophage and then burst uh, the macrophage to be released into uh, the body. The, the, more, the, the more important characteristic about uh, Candida Glabata is is naturally resistant to azoles and or tolerant to azole drugs uh, because of several mechanisms. The first mechanism is the increase of ABC transporter excretion. So the Candida Glabata is able to uh, excrete uh, antifungal like azoles drugs outside of the cell to survive. They're also able to uh, exogenously uh, take the steroid from the media to put it into his cell wall. He's also able to uh, load, loss some mitochondrial function and to have an abnormal number of chromosomes leading once again to uh, resistance or tolerance to azole drugs. So Candida glabata uh, is part of the Candida genus, but uh, is actually more closely related to Saccharomyces cerevisiae than to Candida albicans. So Candida uh, glabrata cell wall, like most fungi, like all fungi actually, are composed of several layers. The first layer uh, is the cell membrane containing ergosterols. Then you have a layer of chitin, a layer of beta-1,3 glucane, a layer of beta-1,6 glucane, and then you have protein and sugars like mana. Uh, so the, the antifungal drugs, uh, because of the special uh, nature of the fungal cell wall, are all focusing on this uh, cell wall. The first class is the polyen family containing the amphotericin B, which is able to bind ergosterol, leading to uh, cell wall destabilization and to cytoplasm leakage, which lead to uh, the death of the fungi. Then you have the azole family, like containing voriconazole and also flu fluconazole, which are able to bind and to inhibit the function of ERG11, the gene responsible, the protein responsible for the ergosterol production. Then, once again, it leads to membrane destabilization uh, because the, the fungi is not able to produce ergosterols that are very important for the composition of the cell membrane. And then the fungi is not able to grow properly. The last uh, known family of antifungals are the echinocondin family, which contain caspofungin. Caspofungin is focusing on the cell wall, it's blocking the production of beta-1,3 glucane, leading once again to cell wall destabilization and uh, cytoplasm leakage. So kinase uh, is a very interesting family for uh, drug discovery and also for because it's a uh, gene responsive, responsible for uh, stress um, signaling. And they are, uh, it have, they are very conserved uh, active sites, and there is a um, specific kinase for uh, the fungi kingdom, which uh, means that it's very interesting to design new, new drugs because this drug will not uh, target any kinase in uh, the human body. So it has been proved both in, in Cerevisiae and in Candida glabrata, that caspofungin, uh, that the PKC1 uh, pathway is able to um, 
mediate the caspo function tolerance through uh, SLT2 activation. In another study from Transmuller et al. in 2014, they constructed uh, six, more than 600 mutant strains uh, encompassing 12% of the genome and corresponding to 36 kinds gene. Uh, that uh, 11 kinds gene were involved in antifungal resistance, uh, proving once again that uh, kinase genes are in fact very good target to design uh, new drugs against fungi. And another study from Lea Cohen's lab, they uh, used genetic and chemical approaches to identify new promising compounds to restore sensitivity to Casper fungin. So they identified the 2,3-aryl pyrazole pyridine, which is able to block YCK2 pathway and to, to mediate uh, echinocontin sensibility. And finally, and the last, uh, this last publication from Liu et al. 2021, they identify a new compound, the ponatinib, which is able to uh, block fluconazole uh, excretion and leading to fluconazole hyperaccumulation, uh, restoring sensitivity to fluconazole inside uh, tolerance strain. So in fact, uh, we know that uh, kinase are in fact very good uh, potential target for to design new drugs. So my project focuses on two uh, different axes. We have first uh, a chemical bank containing 10,000 molecules. It's actually uh, kinase inhibitor molecules, which are uh, synthetic uh, molecule close to ATP, which are the, which is the substrate of kinase. And the second part of my project is focusing on uh, a del of a del uh, making a mutant bunk of the 126 gene kinase gene inside uh, Candida glomerata. And I will focus on this part of my project in this presentation. So as I said, there is 126 gene kinase gene in Candida glomerata genome. 101 of them are non-essential and 25 of them are essential. So uh, I will the strategy to delete to delete the non-essential gene in this project. So we just uh, amplify the five prime region of the kinase gene and the third prime region of the kinase gene with pr specific primers. We then amplify our selection marker. In this case, is the tryptophan gene, and then uh, we fuse the five prime the third prime of the gene with the tryptophan gene, and then we transform a strain that is uh, tryptophan oxotroph to uh, select the, the mutant. And by homologous recombination, the two, the five prime region and the third prime region should uh, recognize the target region and then uh, replace the kinase gene by the tryptophan gene. For, so to construct 101 mutant, uh, we need a lot of different primer to amplify both uh, the five prime region and the third prime region. We, we also need specific primer to amplify and barcode the tryptophan gene. And finally, uh, primers also to screen the, the, the mutant. So I first started my project uh, by ordering my primers to Thermo Fisher Scientific. And I was able with this company to construct uh, 29 cassettes and to delete successfully uh, 26 genes. But because of the COVID situation and the delays into the shipping, uh, I had several months uh, delays to receive the primers for the, the next gene. So I take advantage of the syntax from DNAScript, which I've been just installed into a Pasteur Institute to continue my project uh, with their primers. So I was uh, able to construct 44 cassettes with, with their primer. I was able to transform successfully uh, 39 strain to obtain 39 different uh, Chinese mutant with uh, syntax primers. Once I obtain 
uh, my mutant. I played them on my favorite uh, antifungal drugs. So in this case, you have fluconazole. And I'm recording the, the growing defect. And then I'm able to identify which kinase gene is important for uh, antifungal tolerance. So in this case, with fluconazole, I identify three genes which are uh, responsible for which are implicated in oxidative stress response, regulation of fungal cell wall, and also uh, mRNA processing. I did exactly the same with voriconazole and other azole drugs, and I was this time able to identify six different genes which are important for uh, voriconazole tolerance. Uh, oxidative, so once again, uh, gene important for oxidative, oxidative stress response, also in cell wall organization and uh, different uh, signal, signaling uh, pathways. Uh, tested uh, drug is the caspophongin, and once again, I identify several genes. In this time, it was seven, seven different genes uh, implicated once again in uh, stress tolerance, also in uh, signal, signaling, uh, cell wall organization, and also mRNA processing, signaling, and uh, transport. Once I identify my different uh, kinase gene, we, we know that most of them are implicating in cell wall organization, so I just played them on compounds that uh, destabilize, destabilize the, the cell wall. And very interestingly, I identify, as you can see, the wild type uh, is not able to, to produce uh, IFEs or pseudo IFEs. They just, uh, they just look like normal yeast. But my different mutant on this uh, specific compound we're uh, producing a pseudo IFIs, which is very odd for Candida glabrata, which normally is not able to produce uh, this kind of pseudo IFIs. Then play them on another compound inducing cell wall destabilization, uh, calcofluor white. I, uh, I, I identify that once again, the wild type was not able to produce any kind of uh, IFIs or pseudo IFIs, and my different uh, kind of candidate mutants who are able to produce IV and to uh, aggregate. So to conclude on uh, this technology, uh, uh, we can say that uh, the, the availability of uh, DNA script primer on the campus was a really a good help for me because I was able to rapidly uh, design and produce my primer so I was able to design them one day, and the day after, I was able to, to just print them and uh, use them directly in the lab to obtain my mutants. So I have just still few mutants uh, to produce, and to I have still also to phenotype all the mutants that I obtained this way. So the next step of my project is to identify the uh, the best identify the kinase candidate to to target uh, for uh, new drugs. Also, I should uh, inactivate these kinase in clinical isolate, which are already resistant to antifungal drugs, to see if uh, this mutation restores sensitivity to the drugs. I should also complement uh, the kinase mutant to be sure that it was really this gene that was uh, responsible for the sensitivity uh, phenotype. Finally, I should also phenotype all the mutants that I obtain uh, to, to have a better overview of the role of each kinase gene in uh, the phenotype. So thank you for your attention and I'm ready to take any question. Thank you very much, Colin and Stephen, for a really interesting presentation. Uh, it's now time for our question and answer session. Um, please do continue to send in your questions. You can do so by clicking on the purple Ask a Question icon to the left of your screen. So the first question we have to kick us off today is, 
can DNA and RNA modifications be encoded with this platform? Um, yeah, so currently the syntax system supports standard uh, ATCG DNA bases, but in early 2022, we will be adding the support of DNA modifications, including biotin uh, and a selection of floors and quenchers. And we're working to enable de novo RNA synthesis with future products, but that is not available at this time. Great, thank you. Uh, next question we have is, you say that Syntax is now available. How much does it cost? That's a great question. We we offer several solutions based on your Oligo needs. So I would recommend to please reach out to discuss with one of our sales reps. So you can reach out to contact at dnascript.com. Thank you. Uh, next we have, can I do a partial plate synthesis? Could I print all different sequences on a plate and can I print the same sequence multiple times? Uh, so we designed the syntax system to support a range of use cases, including partial plate synthesis and printing 96 unique or replicate sequences in every run. Our sales team is happy to meet with you and discuss your particular needs whenever you guys are ready. So uh, you can visit our website uh, or send an email again to contact at dnascript.com and we can, we can get your answer to you. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, how do I know that the system performed well, i.e. that I have the correct oligos? So prior to synthesis, our console software will evaluate each sequence you want to synthesize to estimate the final synthesis quality. Uh, sequences that may be challenging to synthesize are flagged with an indication of what in the sequence might cause that issue. At the end of synthesis, the oligos are purified, quantified, and normalized. The quant measurements are logged and reported. So you do have the opportunity to adjust designs prior to synthesis, and you'll receive a report of synthesis performance at the end of a run. We also offer IQ, OQ, PQ services to support use in biopharma uh, or CRO workflows. Fab, thank you. Uh, next we have, can I use oligos from Syntax to build genes? So yes, there's nothing inherent uh, to the oligos to prevent assembly into gene fragments. And this is definitely an application that we are actively developing for. We're always interested to know the specific needs of anyone who's interested, uh, particularly in this application. So please reach out to us through our website or again at uh, contact at dnascript.com if you're interested in learning more about how the syntax may be able to help with this application. That's great. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, next question we have here is, is there any difference between oligos produced on the syntax system and the oligos you get normally from chemical synth synthesis providers? Dr. Claret, do you want to take that one? I think that one might have been directed towards you. And your use uh, uh, as you want uh, i can answer that if you if you want uh, actually i did not notice any difference between the oligos produced with uh, demo fisher and uh, the script except that the concentration was quite lower with the script but it worked perfectly fine for doing any pcr great thank you um next we have does the transformation work as if efficiently with the constructs produced with the DNA script primers as compared to primers obtained from chemical synthesis providers? Uh, once again, I did not uh, spot any differences between the two de techniques. I think uh, the, the, the major issue with transformation is the location of the gene inside the genome. So once you have your correct cassette, then the transformation is only like relying on the position of the gene. Fab, thank you. Uh, next question we have here is, what is the scale at which we can make these oligos? Is it for R&D small scale or can it be used for manufacturing or bigger scale? What is the biggest length of oligo possible? Um, so the we at this point in time, we can synthesize up to 96 oligos uh, in parallel. And ultimately you get 200 to 300 picomole per well which can be normalized to four to seven micromole uh, per well. 
So um, that is the scale that we can that we can produce in any given run. And the largest oligo that we can synthesize on the syntax uh, is at the moment uh, 60 nucleotides, uh, with of course the ability to have custom iDNA of 15 to 40 nucleotides. So you can technically have up to um, an 80 nucleotide oligo, uh, uh, sorry, a 100 nucleotide oligo if you consider uh, having a full 40 nucleotide customizable iDNA and then the full 60 de novo synthesis off of that. And we are um, consistently working on um, enabling longer and longer sequences. EDS inherently, uh, enzymatic DNA synthesis, we've proven to be able to go well over 200 nucleotides. It's just about the implementation of that on the syntax instrument um, that makes it so that it's not the same the same length. Fantastic, thank you. Our next question we have here is, do you have to use the entire 96 well plate on a run? If you just need a few oligos, does that use up an entire plate or kit? So, so uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, you can do partial plate synthesis. Uh, so you can you can do partial plate synthesis, or you can print a full plate of 96 unique sequences or replicate sequences in every run. So it's flexible in that regard. Great, thank you. And next we have, what is the outcome or amount of the produced oligos on average? Uh, so 200 to 300 picomole per well, and you can normalize to four to seven micromolar. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think that's all that we have time for today. Um, I want to say thank you again to Dr. Colin Corret and Stephen Quistad for today's really informative webinar. And thank you to everyone who's joining us online and for sending in your questions today. Um, I hope you've all found this to be a really worthwhile session. Uh, if we didn't have time to answer your questions, we will follow up with these after today's event. And if you have any other questions, feel free to email me at editor at selectscience.net and I will follow up with your questions for our speaker. You can also download a certificate of attendance for today's session, which is in the related resources tab to the left of your screen now. And if you'd like to listen again to today's webinar or invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in just a few days time. So goodbye and thank you once again for joining us.